All right. Top of the morning to you, as the Irish would say. Good morning, Jem. It's uh, Sunday once again, and it's great to be able to um, be back in Jem service. Um, this will be the last time that I will be joining Jem service away from Indonesia because I'm on the way back with Sonia and my two kids. And so we're excited to be able to be traveling back to Jakarta now. Please pray for everything to go smooth and everything to be negative in terms of test results and positive in terms of spirit. And uh, yeah, we're just excited to see everyone. So um, really looking forward to that. Also want to share um, for um, Mike and Icha's daughter, Rachel, who went through surgery yesterday, uh, continue to pray for her recovery. Apparently it all went well. And so it's really great to hear that that went well. So before we jump in, we're, we're, as you can see, we're continuing on from, uh, from last Sunday, the Being With God sermon that I did. And we're in part two today. So uh, before we jump in, let's open up with a word of prayer. Let's all bow our heads and let's pray. Father God, Lord, we uh, are grateful for this opportunity today, this Sunday. Once again, Father, even though we're in our homes, we get to um, be with one another virtually. We get to be with you directly, God. Uh, we get to spend time with you in your presence. We get to reflect on who you are. And uh, Lord, I pray that uh, we can just be in a, a place right now, Father, where our hearts can be tuned into you, God, tuned into your spirit, where your word and where the sharing today can really touch our hearts and help us to be um, just more, uh, more motivated, God, to be with you, more motivated and more excited, really, to be in relationship with you, God. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to share once again, the privilege to share for these wonderful brothers and sisters and friends here in Gem. Uh, please speak through me, God, and help this to be uh, another sermon which can just bring impact and bring um, guidance to to each and every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. So um, I did promise I would be doing a part two, and uh, I've been very busy packing and getting ready to travel, but here it is. It's here. And you know what I realized? I realized that there needs to be a part three. And uh, maybe when I do part three, I'll realize there needs to be a part four. And then it's going to end up being like Fast and the Furious and will never end. Um, but no, seriously, I, I do need to do one more part because I realized that the being with God aspect, um, which is the, the final part we need to talk about, um, is, is what takes a little bit more exploration. But if you remember, I, I spoke about two of these postures, two of these ways we view um, a relationship with God. And um, it's been really awesome to hear what you guys thought about that. I've, I've had some discussions with some of the brothers about it. I heard the responses last Sunday. And it was just great to see how people were processing and chewing on this and, and trying to apply it to their own relationship with God. So if you weren't there last Sunday, basically, I've been speaking from material um, that I've picked up from this great book called With by a pastor from America called Sky Jathani. And he talks about four different types of postures with God. Posture meaning um, the way that we view him, the way that we build a relationship or the way that we, yeah, the way that we see God essentially. And uh, so I wanted to just start off by reiterating a few things. Uh, one is that, you know, within all of these different postures, there's a similar root issue, let's say. And that is that they're all forms of idolatry. There's something in our lives that is taking the place of God, the place of a relationship with God himself. So, so whenever that happens, that's an idolatry issue. That's a very fundamental um, issue in the Bible that we see. So, so none of this is kind of new material that we haven't heard of before, but the way that it's presented, I think is super helpful and super clear. And so that's why we're talking about it. Um, and the other thing that I want to say is that you know, in each of these different postures, we can find a lot of scriptures to back up and support these postures. So just to take an example from last week, you know, life under God, you know, we can look in the Bible, we can find tons of scriptures which talk about our obedience leading to blessing from God. There's, there's so much we can find there. And, and that's not to say that that's wrong. Please don't, please don't mistake uh, me for the, in, in what I'm teaching today. It's not that that's wrong. The danger is an idolatry issue, as we discussed. It's when we look at that, we look at our obedience and God's reward, and we say that actually that is more important. That becomes the, the measurement for who God is. That's what we depend on. That's what gives us security, my obedience and God rewarding that. That's the real danger there. 
And that's something that God warns about in the Bible. Jesus addresses in his ministry. And that's what we're, we're jumping into and talking about today. So, so I just want to start off with those two. Um, I don't want to say disclaimers, but I think just um, points that are important to, to bear in mind. Um, there's an idolatry issue connecting them. And there's tons of scriptures to support each one. But we have to remember that the danger is when we take that uh, view and we make that the definition of who God is. So last week, what did we talk about, guys? Do you remember? We talked about life over God. And do you remember how to explain that one? Do you remember what I was talking about? Uh, essentially, it's when your dependence on, on principles and, and wisdom is greater than your dependence on God himself. So you believe that there's these divine principles, that there's, there's a way of life um, that, that needs to be lived in order to have a Christian life, in order to have a successful life, in order to, um, to be most effective, let's say, in life. And of course, God wants us to be effective. God wants us to have a successful life. I mean, who, who here wouldn't want that too, right? God, I think, wants that for us. But the problem, again, is when we desire um, those principles, we, de we desire that natural law more than we desire the character of God himself, more than we desire Jesus. And we strip out relationship with God so that we can cut straight to um, the practicals of having a Christian life. And, and, and so that's the, that's the life of a God. We talked about it. it the, the writer in the book spends a bit more time talking about how the post-enlightenment age has led to the rise of this. So I don't want to go into that too much, but basically the the change in the way that humans think as a result of the Enlightenment period, which also led to the rise of um, atheism, for example, uh, and secularism, that has led to that creeping into the Christian mindset too. And this is where that comes from. Want to learn more about that? Read the book. Life under God, part two. Do you remember what life under God means? Basically, it's a cause and effect type of view of God. So, so God is reduced to an obedience reward relationship. So the focus then becomes on doing the right thing, uh, avoiding doing the wrong things. Um, so, so, you know, God is basically determined by your obedience uh, to his commands and, and his ability to reward that. OK, so if I'm facing hardship, if I'm facing challenges, it must be because I failed somewhere spiritually. I messed up somewhere. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm struggling here. And on the flip side, if I'm if if I'm suddenly doing well and I've I might, you know, I've made a ton of money and something went well in my work or my family, it must be because of my obedience to God. And where do we see this? We see this all throughout the Bible. We see this today in our lives. Uh, one example that kept popping into my head, maybe you're thinking of your own, but one was if you've read the book of Job in the Old Testament, when Job goes through this incredible hardship when um when Satan is is testing him under the permission of God. His friends are kind of talking to him and giving him advice. And his friends are basically telling him, it must be because you sinned. It has to be because you sinned that, that this is happening to you. And of course, that was not the case. And that was very upsetting and distressing for Job to, to have to work through that. So we talked about those two last time. We won't be talking about those today. We're going to look at life from God and life for God today. Those on the left of this, um, this table here. And so, um, so that's what we're going to be focusing on today. So let's jump in and talk about a life from God. So like I said, in each of these postures, we see an idolatry issue at play. So let's think about life over God, which we just talked about. The idolatry issue is that we, we, we take the natural law or principles and we elevate those above God. That becomes more important than God, the principles. Life under God, divine will and obedience to him. And the avoidance of God's wrath becomes more important than God himself. Life from God, what do you think is at the center? What do you think is, is the idolatry issue? What do you think has been raised above God? Well, actually, it's you. It's me. I am the center. Right? It, now, now the universe revolves around me. And that's what a life from God is all about. And in this book, the writer you know, talks about how consumerism and materialism especially in the last let's say couple of decades um, has really or maybe in the last 30 40 years let's say has really driven a rise 
in this life from God mentality. You know, we live in a world and a culture where we have more choice than I think ever before. And in Indonesia, we're certainly catching up, right, with the rise of, of online shopping. And there's, there's so many different options that we have as well in terms of food. But for those of us who have spent time in America or, or like me in the UK, um, it's just crazy even going to a grocery store just to see how many options there are. I think particularly in America, I remember I was in Texas last year and walking into a grocery store, there were like 20 different kinds of milk. There was oat milk, there was goat milk, there was cow milk, there was cashew milk. I mean, how do you even milk a cashew? Um, there, was a, there was a whole aisle of bread. I mean, all, all kinds of bread, wheat, no wheat, whole, white, everything. Um, and, and, you know, when we think about this, this consumer focused world that we lived in, I mean, it's great in the sense that we have these options. It's wonderful. I mean, we get to enjoy a lot of things that people never got to enjoy before. But as a result, you know, the entire industries are shaped around pleasing you as a consumer so that they can earn your dollar. Um, you know, there's, there's so much focus now on, on making the consumer experience the most convenient the most pleasant, the most delightful, which is a word that's often used in, um, in tech companies uh, at the moment, consumer experience, delightful. And there's multi-billion dollar industries that revolve just around making our lives easier. And so when we think about this consumeristic mindset that has really seeped into our lives, um, you know, our focus can so easily just become on our own happiness. Right. I'll, I'll, and that can seep into our spiritual life, too, and, and our view of God. Right? I'll come to church. I'll get to, to know God if it makes my life more convenient, if it improves my life, if it increases my happiness, if it, if it increases my chance of finding a boyfriend or a spouse, then, then, I'm, then I'm in. I'm game. And so what happens is God exists to supply our needs and God becomes a means to an end in our life. Very dangerous. Um, but, but you know, when we read the Bible, there's some merit to that view, right? I mean, doesn't the Bible talk about God giving us great things? I mean, look, take the um, book of Matthew where Jesus says, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone, or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake. I mean, if you guys who are evil know how to give good things to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him, right? So the scriptures like that. There's even one in James which talks about all good gifts coming above from from head from God, the the Father of lights. Uh, and so there's so many passages which talk about God giving to us. However, receiving gifts from God is not the entirety of who God is. In other words, God's value in our lives is not determined by how much He gives. And, and when you look at, for example, today, one of the, the fastest growing movements in, in Christianity is the prosperity gospel movement, right? And this is life from God on steroids. This is taking it to the extreme. So there are, there are whole churches with thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people now around the world or millions of people, perhaps, who, um, who basically have subscribed to the belief that if you worship God, if you get close to him, if you sacrifice and give to him, then God will give you great things. God will reward you in a multiple of what you can um, reward, reward God with. And isn't that very convenient? Isn't that very easy to package and to sell like a product? Isn't that what the consumer wants? It doesn't ask us to change. It doesn't ask us to change what we desire. It doesn't ask us to change what we seek, what we do. It doesn't ask us to change the things we like. It doesn't ask us to change the work that we do or what we work for. And all these things can be shaped by consumerism, and none of that is disrupted or changed by this kind of gospel. So prosperity gospel is saying you can have all of your consumer and materialistic ways and thinking, and then you can add some Jesus on top of that. The writer in the book says it like this, life from God is consumerism with the Jesus sticker slapped on the bumper. Can you see how life from God is all centered on yourself and what is convenient for you, what is useful for you. 
you know, the, the New York Times estimates that each day the average person is bombarded with 3,500 desire inducing adverts. Every day, you know, we're being sold on comfort, on luxury. Uh, we're being sold on, on how to have a more pleasing life. We're being sold sex. And what we're being trained to think is that we are insatiable people. Insatiable meaning we're never going to be satisfied. And we always need something greater, something shinier to, to satisfy us. That's the consumer mindset. The consumer mindset believes that a human being is this bucket of unmet needs. And only a new commodified product or experience can meet and provide that satisfaction. The truth is, however, that when we get those things, the satisfaction we receive is very short-lived. It's very temporary. Sure, it makes us happy for a while, but it doesn't last. And, 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 it, and it leads us to this very transactional mindset where everything's value is determined by its usefulness to my life. Or everything's value is determined by how much happiness do I gain from it. And what we're saying is I stand at the center of the universe and everything else revolves around me. Very transactional mindset. God only has value in so much as he provides utility to my life because God is a means to an end in this type of view of God. You know, if you don't like a particular church, you just move because, hey, it's not useful to me anymore. So I'm just going to find another one. And, and church hopping comes from this kind of view. I don't like that pastor. I don't like that teaching. Or, or I couldn't find the right type of girlfriend over there. So I'm just going to move to a new community. Um, that's the life from God mentality. But, you know, oftentimes the things that we um, are asking from God, the things that we're looking for from God are not always bad things. They're not always even materialistic things. For example, health. I mean, is it wrong to, 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 to ask God to bless us with good health? Is it wrong to ask God to bless us with a great family? Is it wrong to ask God to bless us with uh, success? Those are good things. Those are not in themselves inherently bad things. Tim Keller says it like this. Idolatry is when a good thing becomes an ultimate thing. It's not wrong to have good things in our life, but but does our life revolve around having them? That's when they become an ultimate thing. If I don't have this, then my life has no purpose and no meaning. And then, then God himself has no value in my life. And that is the danger. And that is idolatry. In the book, it talks about the word amusement. And I didn't know this before, but the word amusement literally means not to think. And so much of our lives actually is spent searching and seeking amusement. Right. The consumer uh, will pay a lot for amusement. Think about Netflix. I mean, how much is Netflix worth? It's essentially a, a website full of amusement where we, we can switch off, where we don't have to think. We all love to be amused. We all love to be distracted. And, and, and again, is it wrong? It's not wrong. It's great to, to, to be amused from time to time. But in our spiritual lives, are we bringing that thinking into our view of God. Now, do we view God as a distraction too from our pain or from our fear? Is God an instrument of amusement to you? Not like, does God amuse you? Like, does he make you chuckle? But, but, but do you look for God or church um, as a means to soothe your struggles that you're facing? For example, you, you go into Back maybe before COVID, when we would have worship in church, you just go into the church and you raise your hands and you worship and you say, you know what, God, I can forget about all of my troubles here because I just feel something so powerful and so peaceful when I'm when I'm worshiping you. Is that a distraction? Perhaps we um, are so busy with events, we, we get so busy doing church things, maybe we're doing Bible studies on Zoom and it helps us to forget our problems, our stresses. Or perhaps when we're praying, we're just praying for God to bless us, to make our life more enjoyable, more comfortable, so that we can be distracted from the pain and the fear that we're facing in our life. Is church a form of entertainment to you? As long as it keeps me entertained, I'm here. As long as the, the relationships are entertaining to me, I'm going to be here. 
as long as I, as long as it's distracting me from, from, from the realities of my life, then I'm here. But as soon as those, as soon as it stops, we're out the door. We stop going to church or maybe we find another church and we start over again. This is what it says in the book. We seek God church as a distraction rather than helping us experience the joys, sorrows, victories, and defeats of life more acutely and from a higher point of view. God is a distraction rather than a means to actually process and experience and come to terms and make the right meaning of life's realities, pain, sorrow, victory, defeat. He talks about the examples of lepers in the book, people that have leprosy. And, and it's so interesting. It talks about how, you know, lepers, the reason why they, their health deteriorates so quickly is because actually the condition of leprosy numbs your, your um, extremities. So you can't sense pain. You can't sense heat. Um, you can't sense when you're, when you're being burned. They're unaware of that pain. So the danger is they can actually end up getting themselves into a lot of injury because of that. You know, physically speaking, Pain is something that is very, very important for our survival. If without, without the sensation of pain, we wouldn't know when we're in danger. We wouldn't know when we are sticking our hand in a fire. Physically speaking, pain alerts us to the realities of this world, the dangers of this world, and it keeps us alive. So spiritually speaking, what does pain do? Pain actually awakens our souls to seek a beauty, a justice, and a freedom beyond this world that only God can provide. Pain is actually so important to our spiritual lives. This is something that we so easily forget because our consumer mindset is so consumed with trying to avoid pain in our lives, avoid inconvenience, avoid suffering, avoid fear. But the opposite of pain, which is really comfort, being uncomfortable, is actually just so dangerous because we become spiritual lepers. Are you a spiritual leper today? Has life become so comfortable, so convenient, so free of pain that your desire for the beauty, justice, peace of the kingdom is actually so weakened? You're numb to that. Is that you today? Maybe you're thinking, yeah, that's me, but, but what can I do? What do you want me to do? You want me to throw myself into a world of pain? Well hold up, wait there. That's not what I'm saying. We'll get to that point later. But if that is you, I think the first step is just realizing that and coming to accept that, you know, maybe I have become a spiritual leper. Maybe I have been numbed by the seeking of distraction, by the, by the seeking for comfort in my life. Life from God is, I think, best illustrated by the story of the lost son. And, and for time's sake, I'm not going to read through the whole story. Um, and you can read it yourself. But the story of the lost son essentially talks about a man who has two sons. And the youngest son basically wants the inheritance from his father before he's died, which is actually an incredibly, not just insulting thing to do. I think it was illegal. And I think it was basically like the son telling the father, you're dead to me. Give me my money and I'm out the door. And so what the son does, the young son takes that inheritance, his share, he goes and he squanders his wealth, um, living this wild, extravagant lifestyle. And basically, after a while, the money runs out, essentially, and he's left in a place with a severe famine, and he's desperately in need, and he ends up eating um, with pigs in a pigsty, and no one is there for him, no one cares about him. And he wakes up, he feels the pain, and he wakes up, and he, he realizes that life was very good with my father. And so he goes back and realizes that I don't even deserve to be like a servant. Um, I don't, I don't, sorry, I don't deserve to be like your son. I just, I would just be happy being one of your hired servants. So he goes up to the father. And as you know, the story, the father welcomes him, sees him from afar off and just, you know, runs to him and, and, and kisses him and throws a party for him. And it's just this incredible show of, of, of love from the father to the son, despite what he's done to him despite what the young son did to the father. When we see that example, you know, isn't that just a great illustration of this life from God mentality? I mean, he had no relationship with his father. He didn't care one flip about who his dad was, about how he would uh, feel, you know, having that kind of attitude and making that kind of decision. He didn't care about that. 
he wanted to just focus on his life on 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 having the the wildest most extravagant incredible life you know he was like the high roller in the the casino of the bellagio and then lost everything and came back begging to the father uh, it's it's a beautiful story and, and i love this this parable but it's such a great illustration of of life from god but i'm going to come back to this story in a second because actually there's a interesting ending to the story which demonstrates another posture another view of god we're going to come back to that but let's talk about life for god what is a life for god all about in the book um the, the writer shares this example where he's spending time with um, a bunch of christian students at a theological school and he's asking them this interesting question and he gets them to go around and, and they can kind of sharing about some sin they've been struggling with. And the question that he asks each of these students and bearing in mind, these are all Christian students that have grown up in Christian families and they're studying at a Christian university. Um, how do you think God feels about you when you've sinned? And because they were really talking about their sin, they were confessing it they all actually answered the question and to, to the writer's surprise they all shared a similar thing which was he god wants me to do better god feels disappointed god feels ashamed but not one of them said god still loves me i think he still loves me you know life for god focuses entirely on your ability to serve god and to have an impact for him on your ability to have um, basically a, a meaningful mission to to accomplish for God. And so what matters to you most is not God's love for you, but it's how much you can do for him. Right. Do you understand that? So like we talked about the idolatry issue of each of these postures, life for God elevates the mission, the accomplishing of amazing things for God at the center and it elevates that above a relationship with god and it's funny because this is quite a um, extreme response in a way to consumeristic christianity we talked about life from god just now the the other end of the spectrum is this a life for god because we see all these christians these prosperity gospel believers who are just taking and taking and they're wanting their life to be blessed but but they're not giving anything what are they sacrificing and so, so our, our mindset can easily be one of wanting to change people from a life from God people to life for God people. And the way that we can describe this often is we want to turn takers into givers, or we want to turn spectators into participants. And I know I've shared about that many times because I, I desperately want people to be more giving. I desperately want people to be more active. How many times have we talked about Zoom um spectators to zoom participants zoom camera off people to zoom camera on people right and you know what those are all good things we, we would love to see that if your camera's still off we'd love to see you turn it on but but you know we can get this wrong we we, we can lose the point we, we can forget the real goal here and and you know there's so much in the bible which talks about the mission right um the, the life of paul is an incredible example of sacrifice of perseverance of of incredible um yeah just inc incredible missionary mindset but the danger again is when that mission becomes more important to you than your relationship with god and when your dependence um on the mission and your ability to accomplish it becomes more significant than god's love for you in your life you know a closer look at the life of paul actually would reveal that Paul's mission was less important to him than knowing Christ. And, and you can look for scriptures where Paul talks about this, where Paul basically says things like, you know, I consider it all rubbish compared to knowing Christ and having that incredible experience and knowledge of him that he talks about. Or he says things like, you know, um, to, to die is gain, to live is Christ, right? Um, the goal is relationship with Christ, not just serving him, not just having an impact for him, but actually being in relationship with him. Jesus addresses this too in uh, Matthew 7. Have you know this passage in Matthew 7? He says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons, in your name perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, 
I never knew you. Away from me, you sinful evildoers. You know, Jesus is, is talking about people that, that were so focused on the mission of, 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 of his, on, on doing great things in God's name, but they had missed the point about actually developing an intimate experience and, and relationship with Jesus. And that's what the word new means here in, in, in the Greek. It's, it's a really an intimate personal knowing of Christ. You know, in, in our own churches, uh, I'm not talking about Gekadei. I'm talking about the wider family of churches that we belong to called the ICOC, um, the International Churches of Christ. Um, you know, most of us here don't know a lot about the history and the story of that. And that's totally fine. It doesn't matter. And one day we can, if you have inter if you want more questions about our wider family of churches that we're connected to, we can, we can talk. But when we look back at, at the history of our, of our family of churches, even before my own time, when I hear stories of, of people that have been through, you know, decades of, of, of our church history, you know, we started out with incredible intentions. We started out with incredible ambition. And there was a slogan that was used in the, the early days of our church, which was evangelize the world in one generation. And that became the mission. The mission was to send out people to every far flung corner of the world to start churches and have every nation on this globe evangelized in one person's generation. Incredibly ambitious mission. Um, I don't know where it came from. I mean, we know that God talks about evangelizing the world, Matthew 28. Um, but it was just an incredibly bold statement of, of mission to, to have. But, you know, somewhere along the way, that mission became more important than relationships in the church. Um, that the results of the mission became more important than, for example, the well-being of the missionary. <laughs> um, and, and the danger when that happens is people get hurt because people are now secondary to the accomplishing um, of God's mission. And that's what our church faced, you know, in 2003, the ICOC, our family of churches went through a huge crisis. Many people left the church. Many leaders had to step down. And uh, I believe it stems from this life for God mentality. There's a writer called Gordon MacDonald who described this, um, uh, this posture as missionalism. Before long, the mission controls almost everything, time, relationships, health, spiritual depth, ethics and convictions, the end always justifies the means. The family goes, health is sacrificed, integrity is jeopardized, God connection is limited. Isn't that very powerful? For most of us here, we're young in the faith. We probably haven't seen this, um, but I believe that many more mature Christians in our church could, could relate to this, seeing how easily that can happen when the mission becomes more important than other priorities in our life. And obviously our ultimate priority, which is God himself. Um, how about with scandals? You know, many of us know about the teacher, Ravi Zacharias, who was involved in, in sexual sin for, for a period of time whilst actively um, teaching and, and, and ministering to others. And what could, what could I guess, allow, what could um, justify that, I suppose, in, in, in his mindset? could have been this, this life for God missionalism mindset where look at my impact, look at what I've done, look at the, the mission. As long as the mission is there, as long as I'm accomplishing great things, other things become less important. My, my, my marriage, my, my integrity, my, my purity, as long as the mission is in the right place. You know, what about the older son in the story of the parable of the lost son? Remember, we didn't finish the story. Um, you know, the story ends after the father throws the party. The oldest son, it says, uh, when he came near the house, Luke 15, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. It says, your brother has come, he replied. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered to his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and I've never disobeyed your orders yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. 
he was lost and is found. Isn't that interesting? What does that reveal about the older son? Was he jealous? Sure. But more than just jealousy, he had the life for God view. I've given my life to serving you. I've made my role, my, my role as a son, the eldest son, my mission of being a good firstborn, the most important thing. And why have you not responded the way that you responded to my, to, the, to my younger brother? The point of the story is that both of the sons were wrong. And that's why Jesus is telling the story. Both of them missed the point about relationship. Both of them did not have real relationship with their father. Both wanted to use the father. And, and, and that's what the story is about. That's why Jesus is telling the story. You know, the younger son was alive from God. The older son was alive for God. But seeing their father's love, seeing the father's grace, seeing his acceptance, it changed the younger son's heart. And who knows the ending to the story? Perhaps the older son changed too. And both of them had a better relationship with the father than they ever had before. You see, the point is that a life from God does not remove fear from our hearts. Focusing on God as a blesser leaves us at the mercy of our own desires you know, is it ever really enough? Am I ever going to be satisfied with what God has given me? And a life for God, where the mission is the most important thing, we're also left um, in a state of, of wondering, when have I done enough? When have I feel like I've accomplished enough to, to, to say that, 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 that God is pleased with me? And the danger is we can also, when we do feel we've accomplished enough, we can compromise on things because we become prideful or entitled. You see, it's only when we know the kind of father we have that we move away from a life from him where we use him as a blesser or a means to an end and we move away from a life for him where we we use god as a means to have an impactful mission in our lives and we start to be really present and be with god and that's what this is all about that's what this book is about that's what these sermons about is the goal is to be in relationship with him where God's love is real to you, where it's active, where God's grace is having an impact in your life, where your goal is not to use God, but your goal is God. It's only then can fear truly be removed from our hearts and we can start to experience the freedom that God has planned for us. Because I don't have time, I'm not going to be able to spend a lot of time talking about life with God today. That's why I want to do a part three but I want to leave you with this. Go away and study out the withness of Jesus in your own time. Now, I know withness is not a real word. I made it up. But think about how Jesus was with God and how God um, wants to be with you, right? I mean, the word Emmanuel, the name that's given to Jesus, actually means God with us. And in the book of John, chapter one, it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And so the way that Jesus lived his life with the Father is actually an incredible illustration, an example for us. And so um, so I want you to go away and, and just take time to study out Jesus and study out his witness, study out how he spent time with God, his Father, and uh, see what you can learn about that in your own life. See the things that Jesus said and taught people about how to be with God. See how he taught people to be dependent on God and not on their own wisdom and their own understanding. That's the only thing that can bring true peace, true freedom and true joy into our lives. I want to end with Jeremiah 17 verses seven to eight. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the streams. It does not fear when heat comes, its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Only being with God, being, you, you could say being surrendered to him, if you want to use that word, being surrendered to him, being in constant communion with him. That's what gives us real peace. Um, and so next time, I want to expand on this because I, I, I know that time is, is running out and, and I want to talk more about what does it mean to actually be in communion with God as opposed to being in communication with him. Not just back and forth communication, but what does it mean to be in communion with him? And then I want to talk about the, the three stages of being with God, which is treasuring him, 
being united with him and then experiencing him. So that's going to be part three. Um, that's the final, I guess, um, part of this book that we'll be talking about. And I really hope and I pray that this can help us to experience a life with God and that we will actually just see amazing things, amazing transformations in people's lives um, as a result of God working through uh, this renewed vision of who he is. So that's where I'm going to end today. Um, let's close in